Good morning, everyone. My name is Kathy Kunis. I am with the Iowa Chronic Care Consortium, and my title is Training and Partner Relations Staff, and I just want to welcome you all to today's webinar. This is the second webinar in a series that is being promoted on educating community health workers and other frontline staff and caring around specific um, health conditions. Today, we will be focusing on the topic of obesity. And while this encompasses more than just one chronic condition, the impact of obesity on health, be it in a preventative mode or in connection with chronic conditions, is very significant. The goal of this series is to arm all of you webinar participants with some basic information around the specific health conditions. And again, today we're focusing on the topic of obesity. We hope that this helps you to serve your clients and patients that you work with more effectively. Uh, frontline community health workers are uniquely positioned to provide support and link patients with services when they need them most. And when you think about the topic of obesity, so much of really um, either preventatively or you know, from a condition management, we really look at lifestyle and the importance of uh, healthy living and nutrition and exercise and the role of the community health worker is particularly important knowing the cultural aspects of that. I think about that especially in light of Thanksgiving coming up over the next couple of weeks and Christmas and how many times we pull out our favorite recipes from families. So this is often something very ingrained for generations and again community health workers and frontline staff can often be very helpful in understanding that and being able to then help um, patients that they may be helping or clients that they may be working with to embrace those cultural aspects and the kind of neighborhood feel for all of this and yet have an understanding of really how important it is to look at the management of these chronic conditions. We're pleased today and going forward that the Iowa Chronic Care Consortium is partnering with the Midwestern Public Health Training Center that's housed within the University of Iowa and we are also so pleased to have two very talented graduate students who have produced this great webinar information. Today, I want to introduce Molly Lee, um, who will be presenting the information on obesity. In her day job as a public health veterinarian, Dr. Lee works at the interface of animal and human health, promoting a safe and secure food supply and healthy human-animal interactions through developing educational materials for veterinarians, livestock producers, and the public. She was enthusiastic, therefore, to be given the opportunity to use these skills and the skills she developed through her Master of Public Health program at the University of Iowa in a new context by developing educational materials for community health workers. I also want to mention that all of you on um, the uh, webinar today, we want to be sure that you're aware of uh, the two upcoming webinars that we'll be hosting and on di in, uh, uh, excuse me, on December 1st, we'll be talking about diabetes and then on December 11th, we'll be talking about depression and there will be more information on both of those webinars uh, on the link that you receive when you, uh, when you are given the archived webinar, the link to the archived webinar. So without further ado, I'm just real excited to um, turn the speaker over to Molly, and I know you're just going to enjoy this because she's done a great job of putting a, a creative presentation together for all of us. Molly? All right, great. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, and thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, I am very excited to have this opportunity today to present this webinar on obesity, a training for community health workers in Iowa. Before I begin, I did want to acknowledge the various roles and locations of community health workers. Um, Kathy touched on this a bit too. And this webinar is meant to be a general overview. Um, I recognize that some parts will be more applicable to certain people, while others will probably find different parts of the presentation more relevant. Uh, as you know, community health workers have many responsibilities. And since I can't hope to encompass all of these within this webinar, I hope that you'll gain some key points and at least a place to start in helping your patients overcome obesity. I should also note that while this is targeted 
at the Community Health Worker in Iowa, and you'll see some Iowa-specific resources throughout. The general principles presented in this webinar will be applicable to anyone. So kind of the goals and learning objectives for this webinar. Um, by the end of it, you should be able to define obesity, including its symptoms, causes, and common comorbidities, and how it's diagnosed and by whom. You will also be able to describe the impact of obesity, the importance of understanding obesity, and be able to extrapolate the impact on your community and your patients or clients. Finally, you'll be able to identify barriers to the treatment of obesity and tools to overcome these barriers. So what is obesity? According to the American Association of Family Practitioners, obesity results from an energy surplus over time that is stored in the body as fat. Obesity is a disease that is multifactorial, progressive, life-threatening, and related to both genetics and environment. I wanted to repeat one key point in that definition I just gave you that not everyone may understand. Obesity is considered a disease. So whether a patient is obese is determined, is determined by their body mass index or BMI, which is a ratio between weight and height. A BMI table that can be used to figure out this ratio is shown on the slide here. Um, for example, a patient that weighs 180 pounds and is five foot three inches tall, has a BMI of 32. In general, if a person's BMI is 25 or more, they're considered overweight, and 30 or more, they're considered obese. A BMI of 40 or more is extremely obese. There are additional formulas and tables available, and these can help to calculate an even more accurate BMI based on age and gender. The symptoms of obesity are complex. Described most simply, patients with obesity have fat deposits that can occur in either the layer under their skin, which is called subcutaneous fat. Usually that's in their abdominal area or belly, thighs, so on, or around their organs, which is called visceral fat. Both types of fat deposits lead to health problems. As a community health worker, you may frequently work with clients with other chronic health conditions as well, and many of these conditions can be a consequence of obesity or they may tend to co-occur with it. Obesity can affect every body system. Some of the most common comorbidities that you may see in people with obesity include mobility impairments uh, like bad hips or bad knees, bad backs. They may also have have or talk about depression or low self-worth, um, metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of conditions that may include high blood pressure, insulin resistance, and abnormal cholesterol and triglyceride levels, and makes these people more likely to develop cardiovascular disease is another common comorbidity with obesity. Other problems you may see include respiratory issues like obstructive sleep apnea, skin issues like skin fold infections, GI issues such as gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, diabetes, urinary incontinence, and more. So this is a pretty complicated slide. We'll spend some time on this, so just bear with me. Um, this is kind of a a summary table of the multiple causes of obesity. So we'll kind of start in the top left and, and go through this piece by piece. Causes may be biological um, and they may depend on things like your age, gender, and race, or they may have to do things like socioeconomic status. Groups at more risk for obesity include rural, elderly, low income, disabled, and refugee populations. Um, mostly for those refugee populations as they acclimate to U.S. foods, which tend to be a little higher in fat, perhaps larger portion sizes. Psychological causes include different beliefs and preferences. Um, personal body image, motivation, and knowledge may also play a contributing role to this. Social and cultural factors may also contribute to obesity in a patient. For example, certain cultures may see being overweight as a sign of prosperity. Um, some ethnicities may favor heavier women as opposed to thinner ones, and so on. 
A lack of social and family support may also be a risk factor for obesity, as well as stress and a lack of appropriate coping mechanisms. Smoking and substance abuse also increase risk. Uh, organizational influences, such as certain programs or policies, may have an effect on time spent in different environments like schools, work sites, organizations, or healthcare settings. And so then this can consequently have an impact on obesity as well. The physical environment plays an important role in risk of obesity, including access to and quality of foods, access to and quality of recreational facilities such as gyms, um, and then you know, access to automobiles. A sedentary lifestyle where people spend a lot of time sitting is also a risk, um, and this includes extended screen time, especially in children. Finally, um, policies and incentives that affect the cost of food, the environment, and people's behaviors also have an impact. So based on all these influences that we covered here on the left in the yellow, a patient may have a variety of behaviors as related to their eating, their sedentary behaviors, and their physical activity. These are the primary drivers of the individual's energy balance, which then affects their weight, including presence and buildup of fat and its distribution. There are many possible members of the healthcare team that can help a person with obesity, as with any condition that you're working with a patient with. Getting an individual to seek help from their primary care physician, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant is a very important first step. The primary care provider can kind of take it from there and determine if and when other professionals are needed. Um, but you know, the take home point for this is that a multidisciplinary team may be beneficial to the patient for getting the treatment that they need. A variety of food and nutrition professionals, including registered dietitian nutritionists, registered dietetic technicians, and other professionals with degrees related to nutrition may be very helpful to people with obesity. Some dietitians may have advanced training in specialty areas like pediatric nutrition or diabetes education, and that can be really helpful. Health coaches and educators are professionals who teach people about healthy lifestyles to maximize the behaviors in individuals, families, and communities which promote wellness, especially related to chronic care management through preventive and patient-centered strategies. So having a health coach on your team as you work to assist people seeking treatment for their obesity can be really valuable. Exercise specialists provide consulting, assessments, and training related to exercise programs. Certified clinical exercise physiologists also have training relating to using exercise specifically to help people with cardiovascular, pulmonary, and metabolic disorders or diseases, which um, if you remember from a couple slides ago, there's a lot of comorbidities that occur with obesity. So having some of those people on your team can be really helpful. Working with a physical therapist can also be very beneficial for people with obesity. These professionals help reduce pain and improve or restore mobility. And because pain may get in the way of successfully implementing other practices like exercise, physical therapists may help jumpstart a successful path toward weight loss for these people. Sometimes, I should mention, um, a person may visit an emergency room for a different reason, like a complication related to heart disease or something like that. Um, and they may at that time be advised to seek treatment for their obesity. As a community health worker, if this occurs, you have an important role in helping your client to seek a more sustainable route of health care um, outside the emergency room by encouraging them to visit their primary care provider. As community health workers, you have a very valuable um, role in the healthcare team. Navigating the healthcare system can be complicated and confusing, and you serve a really important role as the patient's advocate and a liaison between your patient and these, the different members of the healthcare team as shown here. So we touched on BMI a little bit in a, couple, a few slides ago, but really how is obesity diagnosed? 
in its simplest measure, uh, it is diagnosed by using body mass index or BMI, which we covered. And that's, as a reminder, a ratio between a person's height and weight. The person's health care provider at time of diagnosis may also include a stage of obesity with this number, um, and that uses their BMI. While BMI is correlated with body fat, it's an indirect measure of body fat. Um, so therefore, it's just one indicator of several that may be used. Sometimes BMI may also be a little misleading. If a person has, for instance, a lot of muscle mass, and so they may appear to be overweight even when they are not. Another possible way to diagnose obesity is through abdominal adiposity, which is measured by waist circumference. Um, and then that, that also has a correlation with associated co comorbidities. Abdominal obesity is especially concerning from a health risk standpoint. Finally, because there are so many risk factors and causes associated with obesity, a screening for diagnosis should include a thorough history that reviews things like medical disorders, including medications being taken, family history, and lifestyle factors such as dietary and exercise habits. Looking at the big picture, obesity has a major impact on the nation. In addition to the individual consequences and comorbidities that we've covered already, obesity causes a reduced lifespan and lost productivity in workdays at the population level. Rates of obesity are only increasing, and I'd like to kind of demonstrate that in another quick video here. The following animated map is based on the CDC's Center for Disease Control and Prevention's National Statistics on Obesity from the years 1985 to 2009. The darker colors in the map obviously indicate a higher rate of obesity than the lighter colors. In 1985, the eight bluer states have the highest obesity rate, between 10 and 14 percent of their entire population. The rest of the states are either below this number or no data was available. Time traveling forward to 1991, we see a darker shade of blue is introduced for the states that have risen to the 15 to 19 percent obesity level. Most of the rest of the nation's rates have risen as well. Between 1991 and 1997, more states rise into the dark blue percentages until in 1997 the CDC introduces yellow for obesity levels between 20 and 24 percent. As time passes, more and more states climb into the yellow category until in 2001 a new color, bright red orange, is introduced for an obesity level of over 25 percent. By 2009 many states are either orange or yellow. At least a fifth of our population is obese, not just overweight. That would make it an even higher number, but obese. The only blue state left is Colorado where the obesity rate is still a shocking 18.6 percent. Oh yes, and a new color has been added, dark red, where the people of Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina, and West Virginia are topping the scales at an obesity rate of over a whopping 30 percent. All right. Dramatic, huh? I especially love the music in that one. But in all seriousness, the trends are concerning and access to care is a major hurt hurdle in overcoming this. Um, this obesity epidemic, as it's been called, is the primary driver for a variety of other health concerns which are also increasing, including the epidemic seen in our nation of type 2 diabetes. So remember that the primary drivers of obesity are related to a person's healthy eating, physical activity, and lifestyle habits. Therefore, most treatment for obesity will revolve around behavioral modifications in these areas. So considering how beliefs and preferences, personal body image, motivation, knowledge, social and cultural influences, social and family support, stress and coping mechanisms, access to and quality of foods, and programs, policies, and incentives in place in your community. Changing a person's behavior and habits is challenging. 
but as a member of the healthcare team with the most insight into the patient's lifestyle, as well as the greater level of trust that patients have with their community health workers, you're uniquely placed for success. Um, Use, using the communication skills that you have in your community, you'll be able to meet your pa patients and clients where they're at and in can encourage them to make these gradual be behavior changes and choices that will keep their momentum to change going. One simple tool to help patients move towards a healthier diet is the USDA's Choose My Plate initiative. Um, and this replaces the older food pyramid Choose My Plate gives users instead a visual representation of how much of their plate at their meals should be filled with various nutrients. So these include fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins such as meat, fish, nuts and beans, and dairy. If you go to the choosemyplate.gov website, that includes many additional resources, including videos and printable materials that can be used to learn more, um, and you can share those with your clients. They're available in multiple languages. Working with your clients and community members to select available, affordable, culturally appropriate, and nutrient-dense foods in these categories um, can be challenging but is important. Some ways you can do this is maybe by helping them grocery shop or develop a meal plan. Um, these can help move people towards adopting healthier eating habits. As I mentioned previously, you can also work with a dietitian and the, these individuals can advise on how to include vitamins, minerals, fiber, and other healthful nutrients along with the recommendations that you see here in my plate. It's also really important to be able to work with your clients on reducing certain unhealthy foods that they eat, such as foods high in fats, salt, and sugar. Another resource for healthy, healthy eating behaviors is the DASH diet. Um, DASH, or Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Diet, is another guidance that may be recommended to patients that you work with to help them with the, their obesity. Um, shown here on the slide, the DASH diet recommends six to eight servings of grains, four to five servings of fresh fruits, four to five servings of fresh vegetables, two to three servings of low-fat dairy, and six or less servings of lean protein per day. The DASH diet also recommends four to five servings of legumes such as be beans, nuts, or seeds per week, and limited fats and sweets. So kind of a, just a little different approach than my plate um, with similar recommendations. So use whatever works best with your clients and patients. Again, decreasing sugary foods and drinks in the diets like soda and eating smaller portion sizes is also suggested as a part of the DASH diet. Increasing physical activity is another effective way for patients for obese, with obesity to lose weight. You should help your clients work towards a goal of the recommended 30 minutes or more of moderate activity five days a week for adults and 60 minutes or more of moderate physical activity daily for children and adolescents. Moderate physical activity means that you can talk while performing the activity, but you can't sing. Um, for example, brisk walking would qualify as moderate physical activity. Remember that it's important though for both safety and to encourage your patients and clients to stick with the physical activity to start slowly and build up. Also keep in mind that the recommended amounts of physical activity, those 30 and 60 minute numbers don't have to be done all at once. Um, they can be split up into as short as 10 minute chunks and still be effective. Pedometers and step programs um, that work towards 10,000 steps a day are an easy, affordable way to gradually increase physical activity. So those programs are a good place to start for many people. Uh, people that have difficulty walking for long enough can try things like upper arm activities until they get to the point um, where they can walk or to use that as a substitute for physical activity. It's important to encourage your clients to select physical activities that they enjoy and can do regularly. Activities with partners are especially valuable for support, encouragement, and accountability. You may need to help your clients think outside the box a little with what counts as physical activity, um, and you can encourage you know, unique ideas such as some of those 
shown in the graphics on the screen here, like gardening, dancing, playing with the kids, walking the dog. Um, also remember that most physical activity is low or no cost, um, and so people of all income levels can find ways to be more active. Slight modifications to their daily routine, such as getting off the bus to stop early and walking or choosing the farthest parking spot from a building entrance can also be useful ways. Remember, every calorie burned is one that doesn't end up around the waist, so really being unique and creative in getting that physical activity in um, can show a benefit. Finally, in addition to uh, healthy eating and physical activity, a variety of other lifestyle modifications are important to improving the health of patients with obesity. This includes maintaining or improving self-care, such as getting amount, adequate amounts of sleep, managing stress, practicing relaxation skills, and seeking support from family and friends. I did want to mention that sometimes healthcare providers may also recommend that patients with obesity are treated surgically. Bariatric surgery refers to any surgical procedures on the stomach or intestines to induce weight loss. So the most common types of bariatric surgery that you might hear about include gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and gastric band surgery. It's important to understand uh, to help your clients understand that lifestyle considerations, including healthy eating and physical activity, are still important following a bariatric surgery. As you can see, overcoming obesity is complex and patients may run up against a variety of barriers as they work to do so. Some of the major barriers include health literacy and education and what your clients consider to be healthy eating behaviors or physical activity. You may need to work to change the view of dieting and the latest fads, as those cannot always or are not always helpful. In addition, you may need to find resources in a variety of languages or formats to fit their abilities. Availability of food choices can be a significant hurdle in some areas. For example, food banks aren't always good sources, unfortunately, of nutritious foods, and they may only provide certain types of foods, leaving parts of the balanced diet, you know, a little bit of that my food plate or a section of the DASH diet unfulfilled um, and needing to be obtained from a different source. In addition, some of your clients may shop out of necessity at convenience stores rather than grocery stores uh, for a variety of reasons, such as hours and locations that may not fit with their schedules or transportation abilities. There might be other issues related to access, such as lack of adequate refrigeration or financial difficulties. Issues of access also apply to physical activity. For example, finding a safe location to exercise at a time that works for the patient. Social, emotional, and family systems can be a major barrier, or if these systems can be altered, a major support. Certain cultures and traditions, for example, celebrating special events with certain sweets or valuing larger body types. Um, even as Kathy mentioned earlier, you know, we have the Thanksgiving tradition, which usually involves eating a lot, um, those kind of cultures can, and traditions can be really hard to overcome and may discourage some people. Being aware of cultural preferences and thinking creatively to provide alternate options can help. Um, for example, you might help a client find a healthier option for a birthday cake, like a cake recipe that uses a yogurt or banana base, um, and the whole family can enjoy that and they can still participate in their tradition. Another barrier is special populations with comorbidities. For example, patients with diabetes will have additional dietary guidelines to work within. Um, disabled individuals may only be able to participate in non-traditional physical activities, or patients with depression may find it difficult to accomplish their goals when they're struggling with their emotional state. Unfortunately, obesity is also stigmatized by some people, including healthcare providers and members of the communities. And this fat shaming, as it's called, or blaming, can be a major barrier for patients seeking help. Off-putting comments by people that the individual interacts with, unsolicited weight loss advice, or even things like improperly sized facilities or furniture, like bus seats or office furniture or medical equipment, 
those things can be really upsetting and can discourage an individual from pursuing or continuing their obesity treatment. As a community health worker, encouraging resilience and self-care and encouraging others that attacking the problem of obesity doesn't mean attacking the person with obesity um, can be a valuable strategy. Finally, any time a barrier is encountered, the risk of non-compliance with treatment plans or relapse increases. The good news is that none of these barriers are insurmountable. As a community health worker, keeping in mind the big picture and helping your clients design a balanced approach can lead to success. So as we've covered throughout this webinar, the community health worker is a vital member of the healthcare team for individuals with obesity. One of the most helpful things you can offer these individuals is finding a motivation that works for them. We cannot directly motivate others, but we can help them explore their motivations and build activation when they create their goals based on the motivations that they've chosen. So armed with your communication skills and knowledge of potential individual, societal, and cultural barriers specific to your patient in their community, you can work to identify clients that are obese and encourage them to find motives for change and to seek help before sharing specific information and resources on best practices and resources on healthy eating and physical activity. Supporting and guiding people as they navigate their way in a world filled with advice, sometimes good and sometimes not, related to diet and exercise can be the difference between successful weight loss and development of severe health consequences. Once a person is motivated to change, your role is in connecting them with available resources in their community that they can realistically use. It's important to stress that overcoming obesity is a management program for life and it involves many factors um, rather than, you know, just a diet or exercise program that has a start and stop date. One strategy to use in your clients and patients with obesity is to work with them to set SMART goals. SMART goals are specific, in other words, defining the goal in terms of who, what, where, when, why, and how. Measurable, so that the client can track their progress. Achievable or attainable, and within reach of the person in their current environment. Realistic and relevant to meet their needs and long-term plans and time-based. So in other words, establish a timeline for completion of the goal. Ways to implement these SMART goals, um, you can use a calendar or encourage your clients to log their activity in a journal, um, whether that's eating or physical activity or behavior habits. Those can really help with keeping track of progress towards SMART goals. Accounting for potential barriers, such as finding healthy foods in locations that they can get to and are culturally of interest, or brainstorming exercise options that are safe and interesting them are ways to manage potential obstacles. Many of the resources that you might develop, um, for example, a worksheet that lists locations in various neighborhoods where people can find good and healthy foods, or starting up a walk with the doc walking group, these can um, potentially be used for multiple clients struggling with a variety of health conditions. So helping out an individual patient or client with obesity can be a lot more far-reaching. Sometimes, however, there will still be setbacks. Patients should be expected to go back and forth between behaviors. Ambivalence or having conflicting ideas about something is also a normal part of behavior change. So as as the community health worker who is the member of the healthcare team that regularly sees these patients and is aware of the communities in which they live and work, helping these people to identify and overcome these barriers and conflicts, especially with the effective motivation and communication skills that we talked about, will be key to the lifelong efforts that will ultimately result in successful improvement of the patient's health. So uh, regular follow-up is really key to identifying and solving some of these problems before they become detrimental. Some examples of resources that can assist people with obesity with recovery um, have already been mentioned, like the DASH diet or my, my plate recommendations. 
In addition, having a knowledge of providers, including primary care providers, dietitians, health educators, exercise specialists, physical therapists, and so on, and having a knowledge of their attitudes and skill sets towards people with obesity will help streamline care for these individuals. The ability to understand and use insurance programs, especially Medicare and Medicaid, as it applies to obesity can be very useful. Remember though that many solutions are low or even no cost. Finally, knowing of and choosing from tools to overcome obesity, such as healthy food choices and exercise programs, within your and your client's communities is critical. Um, some ideas are to check with local high schools, community colleges, service, health, and religious organizations, nonprofits, government councils, and other community programs to see if they offer resources um, like peer-to-peer -peer support programs or even things like transportation assistance that can help with access to food or exercise-related behavioral modifications. Um, so some of these programs may be useful and attractive to your clients. If a client has a need that is not met by one of these programs in your community, there's you know, a, a great opportunity here for you to potentially develop one. Remember that they're probably not the only one in need. Also keep in mind that people facing obesity may be hesitant to participate in group activities, but they can benefit greatly from being a part of a group of people who look or seem a lot like they do or simply from a regular connection on a personal level. There are also a variety of statewide programs I wanted to touch on in Iowa that may be helpful. Um, and remember that a lot of these, well, these ones I mentioned are specific to Iowa. There may be similar programs in other states as well. Live Healthy Iowa is an initiative that organizes friends, families, businesses, and communities in team-based wellness challenges designed to promote positive lifestyle change. And many of these revolve around physical activity and healthful eating. The Iowa Healthiest State Initiative is an organization that works to improve the physical, social, and emotional well-being of Iowans and holds a variety of events and conferences um, and features programs available in various communities, work sites, and schools. The Walmart Community Health Improvement Project is working to minimize healthcare cost increases and offers models for communities to follow to make improvements in areas such as retail foods, schools, and work sites. The Iowa Department of Public Health also has information on community health needs assessments and health improvement plans, many of which relate to obesity prevention and treatment initiatives, healthy eating, or physical activity. Finally, there are many national government and private organizations, helplines, and web-based tools that can offer assistance as well. For instance, www.choosemyplate.gov offers fact sheets in multiple languages on topics like saving money at the grocery store and enjoying foods from many cultures that meet the guidelines in the Choose My Plate initiative. So that was a lot of information. I'd like to take a minute to share a real life story of a community health worker in New York making a difference in their community by reading an excerpt related to the Mission Meltaway program. This program incorporates diabetes prevention strategies and encourages lifestyle changes by using a group, group approach to weight management. It features eight weekly support group meetings covering topics such as menu planning, nutrition, physical activity, and mental health. As a part of this program, the local YMCA offered free eight-week memberships to Mission Meltaway participants and provides comparative before and after weight, blood pressure, body mass index, and hip-to-waist ratio measurements. More than 90 Mission Meltaway programs have reached over 3,000 people. 80% of whom were at risk for diabetes due to their overweight or obesity. Participants who completed the program lost more than five pounds on average. In one Mission Meltaway program, 91 of the 100 participants lost weight, 65 increased their physical activity levels, and all 100 improved their knowledge of proper nutrition and exercise after only four weeks in the program. 
Given your important role as a community health worker in Iowa, this could easily be you making a difference in your own community. In review, um, hopefully, you know, while, while tuning into this webinar, you can now define obesity, including its symptoms, causes, and common comorbidities, and how it's diagnosed and by whom. You should be able to describe the impact of obesity, the importance of understanding obesity, and be able to extrapolate the impact on your community and patients or clients. Finally, you should be able to identify barriers to treatment of obesity and tools to overcome these barriers. Remember, you play a very important role in the life of a person with obesity. You can help your patients and clients understand the causes of obesity, why it is important to work towards a healthy weight, and help them find and maintain that supportive healthcare team. You can help your clients explore their motivations and create their goals based on these motives, thus helping to drive behavior modifications that will lead to healthy eating, increased physical activity, and a healthy lifestyle. You can recommend practices and resources, offer encouragement when people face barriers, and be there to listen in a non-judgmental way. Well, these are just examples. They are important ways that the community health worker can engage with the patient as a part of the healthcare team, making a real difference in the lives of people in your community. With that, I'd like to go ahead and thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to take any questions at this time. Okay, it looks like we have a question that came in that said, I have heard of medications that claim to treat obesity. What can you tell me about these? Is it appropriate to bring up with my clients? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are several medications that can be used in certain people to help treat obesity. Um, I do want to emphasize that in all cases, diet, exercise, and behavioral changes must still be a part of successful weight loss in people with obesity. However, in some cases, um, you know, if other methods of weight loss may have been unsuccessful, a prescription for weight loss medication from the patient's doctor may be appropriate. Um, most of these, these drugs work by suppressing the appetite so um, definitely an option for certain individuals and the community health worker and the patient should work closely with the patient's doctor um, and the entire healthcare team to decide on if, when, and how weight loss medication should be used. Um, another important person to loop in would be a dietitian um, to, you know, make, make sure that the nutritional, nutritional aspect of medication is addressed as well. Good question. And we did have a question come in on, along the same lines, um, asking if there were any specific medications that would be recommended. Yeah, um, as not a healthcare provider, I can't make any specific recommendations. And again, that will vary a lot um, with the individual. Um, there are a variety of drugs that could be used and consideration of um, comorbidities is another important aspect of that. Um, you know, some of the, the names of drugs that may be used for treatment of obesity are things like Xenical, Belvic, Contrave, Saxenda, but which one is used specifically is really a team approach with the healthcare provider and that individual's specific needs. Okay, another question was, what recommendations recommendations do you have for managing co-occurring diabetes and obesity? That's a really good question. Um, diabetes and obesity can be really challenging to manage together both because of and despite that they're intrinsically linked. So obesity increases the risk of diabetes and it also contributes to disease progression. Um, so in this case, kind of relating to the last two questions, careful pharmaceutical management is important. So using blood glucose meds that favor weight loss rather than weight gain, or using, if you do use meds um, specifically developed to induce weight loss, making sure that they have a favorable effect on blood glucose control as well 
are important. Um, and then as Kathy mentioned at the beginning, our next webinar um, with ICCC will take place on Friday, December 1st, and that specifically covers diabetes. Um, so that will have a lot of great information on management of this condition as well. Sorry, someone also said, during summertime, I encourage some people to come and walk at a park, but the problem is during wintertime. Do you know of a free CD um, to offer to the public to encourage them to exercise in their home? Yeah, um, there is a lot, you know, tons and tons of different exercise programs and resources out there, lots of training um, guidelines and programs. So there, um, there certainly are resources out there. The challenge sometimes can be distilling it down to find something that is practical to work in the home of an individual. Um, I would, I really recommend, you know, just a simple pedometer, a step counter to try to um, get up to that 10,000 steps or, you know, adjusting up or down depending on what the abilities and needs of that patient may be as a simple way to, to get that exercise in um, indoors or outs. If they are able to go to a public place that has stairs, um, that can be a really good exercise as well. Um, jump ropes can be a good affordable way to do with to do exercise without a lot of equipment um, and then again some of those upper arm activities for people that may not be able to walk as much um, is another good option and you know using free weights or even things like soup cans can be a good option for certain people another question was what community resources would you recommend for weight management that's a good question. Um, there, there are many communities that do have a lot of resources for this. So if you have a YMCA in your area, they're often a great resource. Um, grocery stores can have a lot of helpful information. University extension services in your county are also really wonderful resources. Um, there's a variety of national organizations um, and those, their resources can be found online often, like the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association. Those groups all have consumer materials that can be helpful and inexpensive to find as well. So another thing I'd always consider checking in with your local community health department or your state health department, um, and they may have good links for resources as well. And we did get a comment in from Abigail Nelson that said another good option in the winter for walkers is to encourage them to go to walk loops at the local mall or a large box store. So just yeah. wanted to share that. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, another one was, would yoga or a low stress workout be beneficial for those who are morbidly obese but have like, lack of mobility due to their weight? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Really, anything that increases their physical activity is a step in the right direction. Um, you know, as I had mentioned, some of the signs of obesity are, you know, bad backs, bad knees, bad joints of various um, origin. And so things like yoga can be really good options because those are gentle on the joints. Also, if they have access to something um, like a pool, which can be challenging for individuals to want to participate in, um, but that's also a good easy on the joints activity. So kind of working up from low impact activities um, or even maintaining those if they do have chronic problems with their joints um, can be really good ways to try to start that, jumpstart that weight loss process. Great, and one other one was, you mentioned starting slowly and building up with regards to weight loss and exercise recommendations for patients with obesity. Are there weight loss goals or guidelines for how this should be done? Yeah, um, and kind of as I mentioned with the, um, with the in-home training programs, there's so many training programs out there and some of them may or may not be appropriate. Um, so the key, key takeaways is to develop a program that's safe and that the individual will stick to. So uh, again, you know, I'd like to emphasize that STEP program, kind of 
adjusting up or down from your general target of 10,000 steps. Um, trying to lose one to two pounds per week through diet and exercise is kind of a benchmark appropriate goal for most. Um, and then remember working with the patient's doctor, the entire healthcare team, the dietitian um, to, develop, to develop a customized plan for weight loss um, is really beneficial. Uh, the One of the resources that I mentioned earlier, the Choose My Plate initiative with USDA, they have um, a website called Super Tracker, and they also have diet recommendations and fitness information, so you may be able to use some of the materials that they have as a resource too. Great, great. Um, okay, here's uh, I think probably one of our last questions that we'll be able to get to. Um, are you familiar with any programs for kids or youth? Many kids are not comfortable with organized sports um, because of their weight or body image or short, sore joints. It seems they could use a support group. Yeah, that's a good question. And there are, um, I should have probably mentioned this earlier too, one of the, the struggles with obesity is that mental component as well and just um, getting that mental and emotional support. So in addition to support groups um, where people can exercise together and do different activities to help with weight loss, um, there are support groups that purely deal with the emotional and mental health aspect of obesity and weight loss as well. Um, for children specifically, um, you know, kind of reaching out to some of those same places like the YMCA or uh, your county extension. Sometimes they do have special groups for children specifically, and that'll kind of just depend on your community. Um, the middle school and high school sometimes organize special um, programs as well for those for those kids. Um, so those would be places to look and. One thing that's really challenging with a lot of our kids now is trying to get them away from that screen time. A lot of our society is based now on information delivered by TV and computer um, and and to realize that those are those sedentary behaviors are risk factors for obesity as well. Great. Well, I think that was the last question we had. Um, so if you guys just want to wrap things up and, and thank our, our audience. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, I really enjoyed developing this presentation and being able to present to you today. So um, again, just thanks so much for listening. Um, and Kathy, if you have any remarks to close with as well, go ahead. I sure do. And the first thing I want to do, Molly, is just thank you for a fabulous presentation today. Uh, I think your materials, uh, the amount of time you took to research, uh, the very creative videos, uh, just really made it a great learning experience for us all. I do want to mention that uh, at least a resource I can think of for just a wide range of questions that may relate to programs that are local is to get to know um, your local county public health department staff. And I think that in my uh, work in the community level, they have just become just instrumental to me knowing where I might find, for instance, a school that might be open in the afternoons or evenings for people to walk. And they know of programs that may be going on in faith-based locations or just a variety of things that are, are hard to, you know, put into a national-based webinar. But uh, my encouragement would be to get to know those folks because they're great resources. And I just want to say thank you all for taking time to listen in today. Um, on behalf of the Midwestern Public Health Training Center and the Iowa Chronic Care Consortium, we hope that this was helpful and that it provided you with some real practical kind of boots on the ground ideas around working with your clients and patients that may have obesity. Uh, clearly, this is very relevant to uh, all of us. And when I took one look at that US map and I watched that video, it is just kind of uh, eye-opening as to the importance of just looking at this topic and how we can be more helpful. So um, I just wanna sign off by saying thank you very much. And we look forward to having you all join us again on December 1st and on December 11th. 
Uh, again, December 1st is the topic of diabetes, and the 11th is depression. I believe these are both uh, 12 to 1 Central Standard Time, but you will be getting more information in the follow-up email that is sent out to everyone. So again, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. And, and Molly, thank you so much for all your work on developing this interesting presentation. Take care, thank you. Everyone.